everybody welcome to the second part in this series of videos where i'm talking about how you can create a machine learning project that will make you stand out in the previous parts we've covered data set selection data cleaning and exploratory data analysis so if you haven't seen it yet i highly recommend starting there there's going to be a link because we're going to start right where we left it in the previous one Feature engineering is a frequently overlooked part of data science projects because it's not as fancy as machine learning, but usually it is actually more important to showcase your skills and your knowledge about the domain. I work as a data scientist in financial crime and fraud detection and my whole data science life is basically feature engineering, so I hope to have some good tips for you. So without further ado, let's jump into it. As in the last part, I'm going to be covering the API anomaly project that you can find in my GitHub A Rubrics in tutorials. So pull the latest version, there is a few new additions that I got here. First of all, we can go to the notebooks and you'll see that now there is more notebooks with the modeling and the feature engineering parts, which are going to be the topic of today's discussion. Also, as in the last time, we can go to the API security data sets and download it if you haven't done this in the last part. So let's move on to the VS Code, where I already have pulled the latest version. Now we can go to the notebooks and go first of all to the feature engineering part. And let's scroll up. So this is going to be the part where you develop your custom features for this particular project. The main goals of this notebook are to develop features that are going to improve your model's performance and to investigate their relationship with your target. In other words, you try to come up with interesting features that show your domain knowledge and then you test out, are they going to be predictive or is it just something that you did and didn't work out, which is actually absolutely fine. So failed feature engineering is still better than no feature engineering. So even if you don't know what to do there and you have some crazy ideas or like something that you've read on the internet and you want to try it out, feel free to do this. And if they don't improve the model, still include it. Just make sure that you write in your conclusions that the feature engineering efforts didn't show any significant improvements to the model. There is no predictive power in these features, so I'm not going to include them. This is again, absolutely fine conclusion to your feature engineering notebook. Because the skills that you want to showcase here are your domain expertise, and your ability to wrangle and to transform data into the format you need. And all of them you can do even if your features do not really improve the model and they have no predictive power. Time and time again, I see with students and even with some of uh, juniors that they do a lot of feature engineering and then it doesn't succeed, so they just delete the whole thing. This is a really big mistake because then other data scientists who are working in your team will think that this, um, maybe they'll come up with the same idea. So they will try to engineer and they will again notice that there is no predictive performance in these features. So this is just a wasted effort that could have been avoided if you just documented your failed feature engineering project. So okay, feature engineering is important, but how do you stand out? First of all, your feature engineering should not be blind. Forget all of the auto feature engineering packages. They, they have their place in the ML ecosystem, but they really shouldn't be the focus of your feature engineering efforts. Instead, even if you have one feature that is well argued, that has maybe even sources, so you can show maybe there was a scientific paper that showcased that this type of features are important in this type of predictions, then this is so much more beneficial than just randomly throwing auto ML or auto feature engineering on it and just hoping that it works. So do your research and make sure to argue why every feature could be predicted. Now the second point how to stand out is that you actually need to validate your features after you've engineered them. This is also can be a big mistake if you engineered let's say 20 or 30 features and you just throw them all into the model without previously checking are they even predictive? Is there any correlation with the target? Is there any predictive power? Maybe they're just static and, or maybe they're all nulls and you haven't really checked that. So make sure to check that they are related to your targets and that they are predictive. Finally, again, I'm going to repeat, do not use blind feature engineering or auto feature engineering. It's just going to waste your time it, because it takes a while to just grid search and brute force through all of the uh, combinations of features or like squares of them or taking square roots. All of this, again, could be useful or if you have time, 
but it's not going to make you stand out. So I would suggest skipping it for now. And finally, again, as with every step, we want to end up with the feature engineering pipeline at the end so that we can just take new data, throw it through the pipeline, and it's going to engineer us the features. So now for a small example that I made for this project. Now, first of all, let's do all of the imports here. As you can see, I've engineered a bunch of uh, new, new functions here. And this is another point here that feature engineering shows uh, is a great opportunity for you to showcase your coding skills. So if you can encapsulate feature engineering logic in functions, then this is much better than if you have a just notebook that has all of this codes without any packaging, it's just not going to look as good. So we can ignore these functions for now, but let's walk through them a bit later. I'm here reading in the original data, and then this was the uh, provided supplementary data of actually like the raw graphs that we can use to derive new features. Let's import it. This is how the data looks like. And this is how the JSON formatted um, uh, graphs look like. And again, remember that the goal here is to showcase that you know how to wrangle data. So the more complicated the original source is actually better for you because you can showcase that, oh, I can do it really easily. I can transform the data into any format you want me to. This is a great skill to have as a data scientist. So uh, we're going to use the calls as the main feature engineering uh, input. And here I'm just pre-processing all of this to go from JSON format like this to data frame format like this, where I have the ID of the graph where it belongs. I have a node from and I have node to. This is how the graphs are usually represented as a list of edges where you have a from nodes and you have two nodes. So now that the data is read in, I can go to the feature engineering to generate some basic graph features, such as how many, uh, what's, not, what's the number of edges or what's the number of connections that the graph has, or what's the number of unique nodes that this graph has. In this case, every node is an API and every edge is the connection between the APIs. So when the user went from one API to another, so I can use some not complicated aggregation functions to generate my features. And this is how it's going to look like. So for example, for the ID of graph this, I end up with the number of connections 61 and the number of unique nodes 36. This can be, again, this can be anything as long as you can justify why this could be useful. So here I'm saying that these features can be useful since mo most behaviors are going to have a normal range of APIs that they contact. If this number is too large or too small, this might be a good indication of anomalous activity. So I come up with the features, I explain why they could be useful. Notice that yet I don't test if they're useful or not, but this is something that's going to come uh, a bit later. And now the second level of features that I'm engineering is the node level features. So here I can create the number of degrees that every node has. So just quickly explaining what each feature is. The, for example, node degrees is the number of edges that come from into a node. Again, explaining why this could be uh, anomalous and saying that very highly connected nodes can look anomalous. Uh, here I'm not really explaining why they look anomalous. So this is something that probably I could improve. Uh, but you get the general idea. You introduce a concept, you, you come up with the concept, you introduce it, you explain why it could be useful, you generate it, you engineer it, and then you test it. So let's quickly run these code cells just to create the functions and create the uh, features. Again, it's not really important what I'm doing here uh, and the code itself. And here I'm joining it to the main data frame that we're going to use for model training. And here is how the final data looks like. So let's run this cell. Uh, these are the features that we have generated. And we're going to try to find out, are there any columns that have too many missing values? So usually this would be something around 95% of them are missing. Then we would probably want to drop them. Or when we have features that are static, then we would also want to drop them because they're going to be meaningless for our model. Also, we want to drop the features that have high correlation between each other because uh, usually there is no point of including too many features that are highly correlated with each other, just going to uh, explode the feature space and we don't really want to do that. Models should be as simple as they can possibly be uh, so that they're easier to explain and perform better in real life. And so this is going to be the second reason why we can drop something. Now let's go to the quality checks. So let's find out which features have missing values. We can see that there is four features, all of them calculate standard deviation of a particular feature. 
um, and we can see that all of them have the same number of null values. So this means that they're probably related to the same graph that has just one node. Hence, the standard deviation for them is not really meaningful. But 42 rows is not a lot because we can see that and we can see that the general shape is 1,678. So this is just a very small fraction of the rows with missing data. So we don't want to drop anything because of the missingness and because of the constant, uh, because of the static values as well, we don't want to drop anything because none of the values have standard deviation equal to zero, uh, which means that yeah, none of them are static and we can proceed without dropping any features due to the quality reasons. Uh, the second reason, as I said, is the correlation. So is there highly correlated features that we can just drop? And uh, this wouldn't really affect our model. And as I said, just going to make the model much easier to work with. So what we can do, we can drop, uh, we can plot the correlation matrix. We can see that, um, yeah, we have these gaps here, but maybe we can actually um, drop the NAs uh, just so that it is a bit easier. Um, let me do it like this. So let me do it two pandas. This way it should print it out. And yeah, now we have no gaps here. So we can go and proceed with the correlation. We can see that already here we have some groups of highly correlated features. So for this reason, uh, we, we need to drop all of them except one, right? Uh, so let's say that the highly correlated features are something that's features that correlates with each other, uh, let's say with the correlation coefficient of 0 0.9. So we end up with four features in a group. We want to drop three and have just one remaining. Which one do we choose uh, to remain? This can be either tested with, uh, let's say predictive power, so which of these features has the highest predictive power with our target, or we can use the feature that has highest variance because they usually tend to be the most, uh, the most informative ones. Regardless, I'm using the smart correlated selection um, module from a package called Feature Engine. It's really a nice addition to the, your classical scikit-learn. It has a few pipeline steps that uh, it doesn't have. So one of them is the smart correlated selection. Here, I'm using it to find the features that have high Pearson, uh, Pearson correlation of 0 0.95. And I'm going to select exactly the feature from the group of correlated features that has highest variance. Applying it is extremely easy where we can use the fit and we can list the features to drop just like so. Uh, and we end up with seven features that we can drop. Very nice package allows me to automate a lot of the parts of the uh, more traditional machine learning pipelines. So writing down the observations that the engineered features have groups of high correlation. And because of this, we're, these features are going to be dropped due to belonging to a high correlation set and having lower variance than the remaining feature. So now we're going to drop the features that we've previously identified and we're going to do some EDA for them. Notice that here, this EDA is quite automated. So here I'm using a uh, predictive power and then plotting uh, dis distributions against each other to evaluate if these features are going to be predictive or not. So here I'm using the function that I developed, feature predictive power, and we can plot all of them. You can go through this yourself if you want, but basically just showcases, yeah, the distribution of features um, and how they relate to the target. This helps us again understand, did the features that we engineer, do they actually make sense or we can just drop them and they're not going to be informative at all. So probably predictive power of around 0 0.1 or 0 0.05 would be low enough for us to drop. So we can look at the final features here and we can see that actually we have some features uh, that have very low predictive power. So the minimum local source degree has absolutely no predictive power. And then the minimum local destination degrees also has no predictive power, so we can drop them. Everything else has relatively high predictiveness score, which is great to see uh, that the most predictive features are actually global. So we can see that minimum global destination and maximum global destination, number of connections, uh, yeah, all of them are very predictive, which is nice. So we can say that the final engineered features are a list of these features. Again, let's measure how many of them are here. This is nine features. We have nine features remaining. And here is our full feature engineering pipeline. 
So here is the list of selected features that I took from here. And the full um, pipeline is basically that we are uh, reading JSON, we are translating it to the format that we saw before. So from JSON, we end up with a usable data frame. Then we calculate the global and local degrees. Then we use the function called get graph features that I've created to kind of package all of the feature engineering that we did. And then I'm just using a select method to select the ID and then all of the engineered features. And so we can save our engineered features to the supervised clean data with features parquet file that we're going to use in our machine learning part. And now a quick summary here. So 18 features were generated, which have measured graph and node related features. Uh, graph level measure features the total size of the graph, node level features measure the degrees on global and local levels. Seven features were dropped due to high correlation uh, within the group. Two more features were dropped due to low predictive power score. So the remaining are nine features. As implications for ML, we can say that engineered and selected nine features are theorized to be useful in the prediction task. So it could be included into the final model. And we argued about their utility above. And finally, we have designed our feature engineering pipeline so that new data can come in, we can put it through the pipeline and it's going to give us new features. Now let's quickly go through the utility functions that I've created for this feature engineering part, just so that you know what's happening there. So let's start from the beginning. Again, notice that all of the, all of the functions are well documented using doc strings and type hinting. This is again a great way to stand out with your quality of code. So this is the, this is the function that helps me to aggregate node features on a, to a graph level because the original data frame is on the graph level and uh, it just involved a lot of code repetition. So that's why I decided to um, create a function to automate this. Uh, nothing interesting here. Here is the feature predictive power. So again, I'm calculating the predictive power, um, specifying if I want to plot or not. And then it returns me with the score and also gives me a pretty plot that you saw before. And finally, this function, the get graph function. So it helps me to build up a nice looking pipeline because it serves, if you remember, as the last step to, to, our, to our data here after it is pre-processed and the basic features are calculated. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. As always, every resource that I've used, all of my notebooks, all of the data sets are going to be in the description. So make sure to download it and follow it and use it as a template for yourself. Happy coding, and I'll see you in the next one.